So I'm here today to talk to you about um, the Dating Iroquois Project. And the way I envision this talk going this evening um, is first, I imagine that since this is the Ottawa chapter of the OAS, most people um, in the room um, are at least somewhat familiar with Iroquoian societies. So I'm not going to be giving you um, a, an, a, an extensive um, explanation of, uh, of who Iroquoian societies are, what their cultural patterns were like. Um, but for those who may be less familiar, we're talking about um, horticultural peoples who lived in villages consisting of longhouses. Um, after about AD 1200, 1300, um, these societies tended to be uh, based on matrilineal, matrilocal um, social organization um, with councils that um, made decisions based on consensus building at both the village, nation, and eventually confederacy um, level. Um, but assuming that many of you are familiar with these societies, where we're going to go tonight is I'm going to start off with a tale of two villages, two villages that may actually be quite familiar to some of you in the room. I'm then going to talk to you about um, the project that has evolved into what we call Dating Iroquois. Um, talk to you about the methods that we employ, quickly run through some results, and then talk about what this all means and why I at least think that it's important in terms of rethinking the way that we write and construct archeological histories. So to get started, Tale of Two Villages. Um, our scene is set in Southern Ontario and Upper New York State. Um, and the two villages that I wanna to introduce to you um, are the Warminster site, also known as the village of Kayagwe, based on its association um, with Samuel Champlain's visit there, and more on that in a second. Um, and the second village is uh, the site of Jean-Baptiste Lenay, um, which was formerly known as the Mantle site, but was renamed um, Jean-Baptiste Lenay um, in 2011. So most of you who may be familiar with my work um, tend to associate um, me uh, and ASI, Archaeological Services Incorporated, the company that excavated the site, um, with the Mantle site. It's been known to be um, a late, large pre-contact village. Um, and at the time we wrote this book in 2013, we thought that the site dated to between about 1500 and 1530. Um, I say um, that it's a complex village because it has this very complicated occupational history. Um, there were somewhere in the neighborhood of 95 longhouses at this site, although only about 50 of those were occupied at any one point in time. And a great deal of my academic career has been devoted to putting out the occupational history of this site and what its role was in sort of um, trying to understand social and political development of ancestral huron wendat society. But we're actually not really talking about settlement patterns today. Um, some of you may also be familiar with this site um, through the documentary, which you ever talked to Ron Williamson about the naming of this or heard his uh, um, discussion during the panel at the recent OAS meeting, the, the somewhat unfortunately named documentary Curse of the Axe. Um, and one of the things that this documentary highlights is that at Mantle, um, three pieces of European metal were recovered, including the so-called cursed axe. Um, and at the time, we thought that these pieces of European metal were among the earliest um, to be found um, on the north shore of Lake Ontario and indeed in the whole northern Iroquoian sub-area. Turning to our second village, um, this is another site that looms large in the ancestral Huron-Wendat pantheon. Um, it is known as the Warminster site because of the, because of the proximity to the town of Warminster. Um, but this is a very large post-contact village. It's actually a double village where you have two palisaded enclosures separated by a bit of a ditch. Um, at Warminster, hundreds of trade beads, axes, Copper and European brass were recovered from the site. 
Um, it's been thought to date to between AD 1600 and the early 1620s to 1630s based on these, this material culture um, and also because of its association um, with Samuel de Champlain. Um, and Conrad Heidenreich has written about this extensively in that um, it's thought that this is the village that Champlain overwintered at in the winter of 1615 16 um, after he joined an assembled party of Huron Wendat um, and affiliated warriors um, who engaged in a raid against the Onondaga. Champlain was famously wounded in that skirmish, could not travel back to New France, and spent the winter um, with the inhabitants of Cayagüe. So for a very long time, or at least since Mandel's discovery in the early 2000s, um, all conventional archaeological wisdom has pointed to these two sites being occupied a hundred years apart in time. And this is, you know, based on the material culture primarily that has been um, found at both of these sites. So this I'm going to give you a very short version of how the Dating Iroquois project got started, which um, begins with my being invited to Cornell University um, to give a talk in 2014. Um, I had dinner with Dr. Sturt Manning, who at the time was the chair of classics at Cornell. We got talking about the Jean-Baptiste Linnae slash Mantle site, um, and he became very interested in the possibility of using the radiocarbon chronological modeling tools that he'd been employing in his work in the Mediterranean to obtain a better understanding of the internal occupational history of that site. And we actually came to um, the, I guess it was the Canadian Museum of History by that time, came to Ottawa in May of 2015 in order to collect samples from the site. Um, during this work, we realized that it would be a really, uh, it would be a really good idea to have um, a firm set of dates that post-dated Mantle for reasons that I can get into later. And so we went to the University of Toronto and obtained an intact post from the Warminster site. And so this was the initial sort of research collaboration that kicked off the project. And I say this to you because as many, as is the case for many research projects, we never intended with the inception of the project to find what we did or for the project to involve, sorry, evolve the way it did. It was a, a long day coming out. Um, so in 2015, we obtained 86 new radiocarbon dates from that post from Warminster, as well as 60 some odd new dates for the Jean-Baptiste Linnae site um, and a few other dates, new dates, for the Draper and Spain sites, which are part of the settlement relocation sequence that John Baptiste Lenay or Mantle is part of. And what we found um, floored me. It took me about two years to come to terms with the results of this pilot project that was published in that Science Advances article. Because what we found was that both of these sites had to be at least partly contemporary. Um, these results suggested that Jean-Baptiste Lenay or Mantle, now dated to, as you can see there, 1587 to 1623, and that Warminster also um, straddled um, very likely the late 1500s into early 1600s. Now, what I'm presenting to you here are um, probability, radiocarbon dates are always probabilities. So these are essentially like a certain part of the non-parametric probability distribution for when these sites date to. Um, and we know that Northern Iroquoian village sites of this era were probably only occupied for about 10 to 15 years. But what this did was confirm for us that the dating of the Warminster site was by all accounts correct, but we'd been really off with Mantle. And so thus, Became, that thus we realized the reason to extend this project to other sites in Southern Ontario to find out if what was happening in the West Duffin sequence and with this project, if we were wrong, if this was an aberration, more work needed to be done. So before I get into the research design for that project, 
um, a few words about archaeological histories. It is a fact that I think is not often stated enough that chronologies fundamentally underpin all other aspects of the work that we do as archaeologists. Chronologies influence how we collect and interpret data, including the sort of conceptual categories or boxes that we put data into. Um, chronology influences the research questions that we think are possible to ask and determine the answers that we're willing to accept. Um, we are all the heirs of a rich corpus of archaeological knowledge. And so in Ontario, this goes back to the work of um, Scotty McNeish, James Wright, um, the, the compiled papers of what we all call the Green Bible, um, edited by Ellis and Ferris, um, and all of this literature and the conceptual frameworks that it creates um, is tied to chronology. Um, and it creates these sort of explanatory frameworks for cultural process in our region, but also, of course, other world regions. Um, Alison Wiley has um, a great concept that she calls conceptual scaffolding. This comes out of a, a 2017 paper that you can see cited there. And what she notes in that paper is that as old data and old ideas are brought into conversation with new methods for analysis and new conceptual frameworks, that conceptual scaffolding is always undergoing reconstruction as we test elements out, move them, and what we actually find is that archaeology doesn't really possess um, what she calls a, an epistemological bedrock so much as it does this conceptual scaffolding um, which underlies all of those explanatory frameworks that we use in our work. Um, so to think about this explanatory framework or conceptual scaffolding for Northern Iroquoian societies, um, this is where we are. When I'm talking to people who aren't in Ontario, I usually have to explain where these groups are, but since you guys are on the map, I think, I think you, you have this on board. We're talking about ancestral and Huron Wendat societies in southern Ontario, um, with historic Wendat settlement up in Thunder Bay, and then Haudenosaunee um, settlements strung out through the Finger Lakes of Ontario. Um, but this is sort of what our understanding of the historical development of these societies is based on. Um, we are so fortunate, those of us who work in this region, to have an amazing record of settlement um, that involves dozens of completely excavated village sites. This doesn't really exist in this way in any other part of the world. Um, and it's really because of the amazing frameworks for cultural resource management and in the history of the last hundred years of archaeology in southern Ontario. And all the data from this amazing settlement record was put together into this sort of developmental history for northern Iroquoian societies, whereby um, after about 1300 in both Southern Ontario and New York State, we see the development of early villages with true longhouses. The way the story has gone after that point in New York and Ontario has, has somewhat diverged, but also is based on a lot of the same epistemological bedrock. So this idea that in Southern Ontario, you have the intensification of intra-ethnic conflict after about AD 1450, the same thing happens in New York after about 80, 1500. There are processes of alliance building that then lead to the formation of the political units that we understand to be confederacies, um, which then lead to um, the, what we understand as sort of the, the historic enmity between the Haudenosaunee and the Huron-Wendat that leads to, oh, and, and other nations, um, but that leads to the dispersal um, of the Huron-Wendat from their homeland um, into Quebec, um, some amalgamation into New York and, and, and other part adjacent areas. Um, and forgive me, I feel like when I'm talking to people from home, I, I feel like I need to recount more detail than I normally would in other cases. Um, so this is sort of the generalized historical framework that we have. Um, but all of the elements of this explanatory framework is based on conceptual scaffolding dependent on assumptions about chronology 
and the contemporaneity of various phenomena, including where certain village sites are in space and time at any one point in time. Um, this in turn influences population estimates like Gary Warwick's demographic history. Um, our materialist explanations for what might be happening in terms of human impacts on the environment, um, the timing and directionality of coalescence, conflict, interaction, trade, and politogenesis. So point being, all of this is dependent on conceptual scaffolding based on assumptions about chronology. In Ontario, our traditional approaches to chronology building in the late woodland um, have included ceramic seriation um, and trade bead chronologies, and in particular, sort of the, the glass bead periods um, developed by Kenyon and Kenyon, Fitzgerald, um, and other researchers working in the context period. So here's where our project comes in. So the Dating Iroquois project was, as I said, initiated in 2015. Um, in 2017, we received funding from the National Science Foundation to construct high precision radiocarbon chronologies for selected Northern Iroquoian site relocation sequences in Ontario and New York, dating to the 15th through 17th centuries. Um, we chose a subset of 42 sites from five different well-known village and really sort of cultural sequences. Um, in, in New York, this was the Seneca and Onondaga, and in Ontario, um, it was those sites in the Trent Valley, the Don Valley, and the Humber Valley, um, because we'd already done some work in West Stephens Creek. So they're on the map, but they weren't part of this new 2017 dating effort. Um, we chose the 15th through 17th centuries because the key problem orientations at the center of this project involve the timing of coalescence and conflict, the introduction and adoption of European manufactured goods, and the formation of nations and confederacies. So at the end of the talk, I'm going to come back to these three points. One of the reasons why radiocarbon dating has been underutilized in this period of late woodland research um, is because it sits on what we call a wiggle in the radiocarbon calibration curve. Um, this is actually the OxCal, um, sorry, not OxCal, INCAL 13 curve. There's now a new INCAL 20 curve, but it doesn't really change this period of history over much. If you work further back in time, say in the archaic, there are advances in INCAL 20 that might affect you, but for now, this, this pretty much remains the same in terms of a problem. What you're seeing here are two simulated radiocarbon dates that when calibrated against the calibration curve, and the calibration curve accounts for variations in the amount of the radioactive isotope of carbon, carbon-14, that radiocarbon dating is based on. And what this means is that either of these two dates is gonna have multiple intercepts in the calibration curve. And so what this means is that your date estimate is spread out over as many as 200 years. Um, but this is the period that these really interesting questions take place in. Um, there were two radiocarbon dates for um, the mantle site at the time that we wrote this book. And as you can see here, there are two intercepts with the calibration curve. And at the time, what we did was sort of pick the one that worked best with our understanding of the re local archaeology in southern Ontario um, and our understanding of ceramic seriation and the small number of trade goods from this site. The techniques that we are applying in this project, however, use something called Bayesian chronological modeling. We use a program called OxCal to do that. Some of you are, are um, certainly familiar with this program. Um, but what we did was collect short-lived samples of organic material from the best kind of spread across each site that we could. So in some cases where sites had only had limited excavation, we were only able to get a few samples uh, and we weren't necessarily sure that they were representative of the whole site's occupation, but whenever possible, we tried to select samples from contexts that we thought represented the whole occupation of a site, or this is um, the ball site excavated by Dean Knight, 
Um, and what you can see here where those little check marks are, are where we specifically chose samples that related to different phases in the site's occupational history. So the early village and the later village. And what we do is use prior archeological knowledge, like the fact that these come from the early part of the village and these come from the late part of the village to build statistical models whereby the model is constructed in a way that tells the program that the, it, it is statistically more likely that these samples were slightly younger um, or later than other samples. And what it allows us to do is actually overcome um, that problem of multiple intercepts in the calibration curve. What you're seeing here um, is a model for sites in the West Duffins Creek sequence um, whereby without the modeling, you get the results on the left where you see those broad spread out date ranges. And on the right, what the modeling does is pull those probability distributions into um, something more coherent with more precise data estimates. So what we're doing here is not totally independent, um, but what it does is incorporate all those generations of prior archeological knowledge with the new dates in order to come up with our best estimates. So I'm going to really quickly run through the results because no one likes staring at um, either those big oxcal plots or um, uh, sequences of numbers. So here's the West Duffins site relocation sequence, Draper to Mantle. And here's an expanded version of what we published in that 2018 paper. So you know, whereas previously we thought Draper dated to 1450 to 1475, we now understand it to date to about 75 to 100 years later, and so on through the sequence. Um, so the next stage in the project was actually to move west and look at sites in the Don Valley. Um, and here too, we found that um, the small unpalisaded pre-coalescent sites that we thought dated to 1400 to 1450 actually dated to 1476 and later. And what's important about this is that those pre-coalescent sites actually hit a point in the calibration curve with no wiggles. So what the modeling allows us to do is tie those later sites that hit multiple wiggles in the curve to more secure sites. And so in a nutshell, what we found is that in the Don Valley, very similar to in West Duffins Creek, um, the sites were more or less 75 years later than previously thought. Moving west again to the Humber River Valley, um, there are two sort of sequences of sites here. Um, we dated only, only some of them, especially for the, the southern part of that area where a lot of these sites um, that originally were there have been destroyed by, by modern development, where like we're in Toronto. Um, but what you can see here for Black Creek and Parsons um, is that again, Black Creek dates to as much as 75 years later, um, whereas Parsons is, you know, 45, 50 years or so later than previously thought. Um, going further north um, to the second kind of group of sites, um, we also see that some of these Upper Humber sites, some of which include um, European goods, um, were only about 20 to 50 years later. Um, than previously thought. But some of those estimates were actually, were actually pretty good compared to what's happening over um, further to the east. Swinging quite far east over the Trent Valley, um, these are sites that are um, known for being anchored by and worked on, sorry, worked on by Peter Ramsden um, and his students and colleagues. And we've got Warminster anchoring the end of this sequence. Um, what you find here isn't so much that sites were dated 75 or so years later, as the case on the North Shore, but rather there's a huge amount of overlap between site occupations. Um, and in some cases, sites are dated to slightly earlier than expected. And what all of this means is that it seems that the Trent Valley might have been abandoned 20 or 30 years earlier than previously assumed, and that there was quite a large population um, in, in this area. Um, that some of you know is probably the result of the amalgamation of, of multiple different groups of um, ancestral Huron-Wendat and other populations from further to the east. Moving south to New York, I won't dwell on New York because what we found in the Seneca and Onondaga sequences was that they had their chronology pretty much bang on, especially for the later periods. 
Um, some of those early sites like Farrell and Footer um, moved up to being as much as 100 years more recent than was previously thought. But for the later end of the Seneca sequence, um, you know, Martha Sempowski and colleagues um, and, and their mentor, um, uh, Ray, um, kind of had it, had it pretty good. Um, moving over to the Onondaga sequence, um, which is famous for being worked on by um, Jim Tuck and later Jim Bradley. Um, again, there isn't a lot of shifting here. Some of the sites move slightly more recent in time, but for the most part, their sequence list was close within a few decades. Although I do have to admit that the Onondaga sequence is far less well excavated than some others. And so some of these um, sites are represented by only one or two samples um, from surface collections. We ran a bunch of dates from the Onondaga sites that was like very modern here. So what does this all mean? When we put it together, this is just a, a visual schematic of how the chronology was understood prior to the beginning of this project. So take a look at this for a second, and then I'm gonna flip you to the same schematic, but with the new dates. So bear with me, sometimes it's helpful to go back and then forth. Lord knows I've done this a lot over the last couple of years. Um, but what you see here are that in Southern Ontario, um, most of our 15th century site occupations end up getting pushed back by 50 to 100 years. And another thing that this does is actually locate those sites in narrower or shorter occupations that more closely approximate the actual uh, use life or, or, or occupation of these periods, something closer to um, 20, um, you know, 20, 25 years or so. So what does all of this mean in terms of the implications? Let's come back to our three problem orientations. So first, the timing of coalescence and conflict. Um, what you can see here are sites where either a palisade has been definitely excavated or inferred because of site location and defensive siting. Um, and the X's mark sites where human remains bearing signs of perimodern trauma, often interpreted as evidence for um, uh, prisoner sacrifice or conflict otherwise. So what you can see here is that by pushing some of those Southern Ontario sites to a more recent period, and again, especially these telltale sites um, in the Don River Valley, what we're seeing is a pattern where at least late you know, late, late woodland conflict um, is something that seems to start earlier um, in New York than in Ontario. Um, and I should also add here that um, John Hart and Tim Abel, who I think might be with us, um, have done more of this work in both Northern New York and in the Mohawk sequence. And I have not integrated that um, into this talk, but it's someone really needs to start thinking more about what's happening around um, the east end of Lake Ontario, um, whereas I'm focusing more on the west. And I know like Tim, Tim is the guy who has been doing that. Um, and hopefully also I think my PhD student, John Mikan, is starting to think more about, about this as well. Um, so here was our previous understanding. Um, we previously thought that conflict and coalescence really kicked up in Southern Ontario around 1450 um, and although we've never really been 100% sure about who, you know, who were the parties involved in that conflict, um, there was reason to believe that we might have been looking at evidence for um, intra-societal conflict between ancestral Huron-Wendat communities. And I think some of this comes from the understanding that in, that has always been the understanding in, in New York State. This is bound up in um, the narrative surrounding the founding of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Great Law of Peace, um, diplomacy in order to tamp down conflict between nations. Um, and whereas this was the previous understanding, what the new dates suggest is that yes, there's internal conflict among the Haudenosaunee as early as 1450, 1500. It's very likely that um, that confederacy starts forming um, and not just starts, but it forms quickly, probably in about a generation or so, after which time that conflict turns outward. And what we see in Southern Ontario is the intensification of conflict, at least around the west end of Lake, Lake Ontario, breaking like a wave. 
um, between the Lower Humber, Upper Humber, Don, and West Devon Valleys. Now, moving over to the east end of Lake Ontario, I have not thought this through yet, but we do have, um, like I said, new dates coming out of this area, new dates that John has been generating for areas like the Prince Edward County and the um, Upper St. Lawrence Valley Grenville Cluster. Um, but I, what I think is the most important thing about this for people who work in Ontario is that A, what was assumed to have been conflict that was driven by the desire to obtain European goods and that still might be implicated. But the point is, is that contact era conflict um, started a century earlier. Second, what this seems to suggest is that there was never internal conflict among the ancestral Huron Wendat. When I talk to Olivia Lesage and his colleagues um, in their office in Wendaki, they say, well, of course, there's nothing in our oral history that's ever suggested um, that we were at war with each other. So what this does then, right, we're, we're moving around the elements in our conceptual scaffolding here. And that means that our explanatory frameworks have to move as well. Um, so what we're now seeing is sort of a revised timeline for the historical development. Um, of Northern Iroquois societies, whereby at least in this late, late woodland period, um, we have the intensification of internal conflict among the Haudenosaunee, but not the Wendat. Um, and what I think proceeds from this is we have to shift our understanding about the normative processes that governed um, politogenesis and confederacy formation in both of these regions. I am not going to dwell over much tonight on distributions of European trade goods, except to say that what the new dating project really seems to suggest is that access to those goods was highly variable uh, between different Northern Iroquoian communities and nations. Um, I have another PhD student named Megan Conger who is focusing on this issue for her dissertation research and also expanding the dating project to include um, neutral sites and Peyton sites from this critical 1550 to 1615 or so period. If any of you have, have read some of the work that we've been doing in recent years about social network analysis, and I'm not going to make this talk about social network analysis, one of the things that John Hart and I have been writing about is the fact that Social networks based on collar decoration of um, ceramic vessels from various Northern Iroquoian communities and societies result in very different network topologies for the Huron Wendat and the Haudenosaunee. The Wendat network consists of what we call um, a bonding network. And bonding networks are typically based on a lot of costly reciprocity, face to face interaction. Um, and trust in the sharing, the open sharing of social capital. Bridging networks, which is what you see um, among the Haudenosaunee, tend to be based on formal diplomacy and weak ties between individual member, um, members of those social networks. If you want to know more about that, read the paper. The point of all of this is that the new chronologies that we have built have major implications for how we understand processes of confederacy formation among Northern Iroquoian societies. Previously, I think that there's been this both spoken and unspoken understanding that uh, normative kind of systems-based processes were happening in both Southern Ontario and Northern New York, whereby we have internal conflict in both regions that results in defensive alliances between communities that go on to become tribal nations that go on to confederate into into these political groups um, but what the new chronology work suggests is something that might help us explain the nature of those social networks so instead we have these multilinear and divergent trajectories um, whereby as I said, internal conflict among the Haudenosaunee leads to defensive alliances and eventually the, the Confederacy in New York, which then turns conflict outward, um, leading to defensive alliances and so on among the Huron Wendat. But we can't use the same the, can't, the same sort of argument to argue for why both of these confederacies came to be. 
Um, we have to move away from that kind of processual systems-based thinking and instead start thinking about historical contingency and writing better archaeological histories. So where all of this is leading is to um, a better understanding about the differential development of these confederacies. We know from um, oral history, and if you haven't read um, Anthony Wonderly and Martha Sienkowski's new book, or you know, relatively new book from 2019, about the origins of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, it's a fabulous resource. Um, and what they're saying really coheres with this understanding that what we see in New York is the relatively rapid formation of the Confederacy within a generation or so, um, the fact that those nations remain in distinct territories and that the way the Confederacy functions is based on highly formalized diplomacy facilitated by wampum, ritual protocol, um, and the desire to um, end, you know, feuding between these communities, again, through these very formal networks that in social network parlance could be thought of as weak ties. Whereas among the ancestral Wendat and the Wendat Confederacy, we instead see this long-term gradual process of aggregation in Wendati that starts with the initial settlement of that region in the late 1300s, potentially the roots of the Confederacy among um, the Adwandranon, and forgive me, I can never pronounce um, the other nations properly, but sort of you know, centering on, on the Bear in northern Simcoe County. Um, what we're starting to understand is that if if there was no internal conflict among Huron Wendat communities, that actually opens up the possibility that people move between um, ancestral Huron Wendat communities in ways that didn't happen in New York and in ways that were previously unrealized um, in those earlier models um, that saw different Huron Wendat communities in conflict with one another. And John Hart and I actually have a paper that's just been accepted to American antiquity that deals with that. Um, so what this means is that instead of a uh, confederacy based on weak ties and highly regulated diplomacy, um, we have a society based on less formal relations, more regular interaction, possibly facilitated by regularly held um, mortuary ceremonialism in multiple communities and nations, and what the Huron Wendat caller George Seeley has, char has characterized as a circular society based on incorporation, trust, and costly reciprocity. And so, I promise I'm getting to the end. Um, what I think all of this means is that when we have higher chronological precision, we can write more specific narratives. Um, and that this means that we don't have to rely on interpretively generalized theories um, that come from this overly uh, systems-based processual thinking in archaeology and instead privilege relational histories um, that generate new kinds of historical and conceptual scaffolding um, that allows us to write more meaningful archaeological histories. And I will say here that I do not think that the work that we've done is in any way a definitive revision of this chronology or history, um, but rather that um, we should all be engaged in, in, in doing this kind of work. Um, and indeed now, um, you know, my, my colleagues and collaborators like among the Huron Wendat are getting um, involved in the forefront of research design as we move into new stages of this project. Um, and so just in general, what, even though um, a lot of this involves very complicated um, science and statistics, what it allows us to do on the other end um, is write a more meaningful history that positions um, indigenous actors in the past and even in the, in the more recent past um, in ways that allows us to recognize um, their ability to act according to their own ends and their own ways and in this multi-linear way um, that is more true to the lived experiences um, of, of these peoples. So thank you to my collaborators on, on this project um, at Cornell and here at UGA and to the Huron Wendat Nation. Um, those of you in the room whose lifetimes of work that this has um, grown out of and benefited from and all of the collections, facilities, repositories and museums in Ontario that allowed us to, to come into your buildings and, um, and take samples. So thank you. <laughs>